Hey, what's up, entrepreneurs? Have you ever wanted to launch your own recession-proof business with the freedom to be your own boss and work from home? That's why I created biz5freedom.com to show you how you can join our team and work together in a business and industry that's allowed me to create my dream life, where I can travel where and when I want to with my family. I can take time off during the week to go boating and wakeboarding with my five kids and wife or go snowboarding during the winter and work in a business that's busy in good times and even busier during bad times. Watch my free workshop at biz5freedom.com. That's B-I-Z-F-I freedom.com. B-I-Z-F-I freedom.com. See you at the workshop. What's going on, everybody? Leo Cannell here with your Seven Figures Club podcast. Today, my friends, we have Stacy. Baron Fuss, who is the founder and visionary intuitive, helping many women who are building seven, eight, and even nine figure businesses. Now, Stacy actually started building her first seven figure business at the age of 19, where she helped clients find their external home in real estate. So she's a real estate expert. She now guides women leaders to their internal home known as the truth teacher and she's a visionary intuitive she's the founder of the truth teachers and as i said works privately consulting seven and eight figure women leaders and their teams leading them to activate all of their power accelerate their success personally and professionally um, stacy and her truth teachers are on a mission to revolutionize the entire self-help industry which is good news for everybody by eliminating gurus and empowering people with the tools and framework like the actual tools the specific so you guys can take action transform your lives she's a 2020 winner of the gold stevie award in consumer services with just 10 or less employees for building seven and eight figure businesses in the meantime stacy welcome to the show there are over 32 million businesses in the U.S. and over 90% of them will never break seven figures in annual sales. So how do we as entrepreneurs or aspiring entrepreneurs break into that seven figures club? This podcast will relentlessly share the secrets, strategies, and tactics I've used to create three multi seven figures businesses and bring in even more successful entrepreneurs than me to share their inspirational stories and tactics to success. You can create your dream business in life right now. So buckle up and let's go. Thanks so much for having me, Leo. I'm excited to be here with you today. So Stacy, we love to find out more about uh, you know the guest background as we dive into this. So just in your upbringing, what is it you think led you down a path towards entrepreneurship? And how did you specifically get started in real estate at such a young age? Yes. I know it's fascinating looking at our backgrounds and really diving in and seeing how much really of where we came from determines where we're at today and who we're becoming. So when I was growing up, I was always in the role of being responsible for, you know, my younger brothers and turning chaos to order, as I like to say it. And so Mm. I was always, you know, in these situations where it was like, I either had to calm everyone down or bring hope to the situation, or, you know, in some way, transfer a tool or, you know, lead someone to empowerment in some way, whether it was my little brothers, or whether it was just trying to you know, be there for myself and navigating really some chaotic waters, you know, growing up in my background. I think that really set the stage for, you know, why I wanted to pursue real estate at such a young age. And it was to really create the environment that I wanted to create without any limits versus, you know, being limited or, um, you know, stuck in, in some corporate structure. Yeah. And so I started my real estate career and what really, you know, inspired that was I was a senior in high school and was joking around with some friends and applied to be a salesperson at a local resort real estate office. And they ended up um, hiring me as an assistant. And so um, I think that really inspired me to see that if you go for something, you know, if, if you see something you want it and you're willing to be resourceful, all that you have to do is take one step, take the next and be willing to figure things out as it comes. And so that inspired my journey early on to, you know, see that if I want something, I can go after it. And by being resourceful, I can see the way through. 
Outstanding. Well, as I always tell my team and, and a lot of our, I guess, my five kids, there's three types of people in the world. There are those that are really good at finding problems, a lot of them. There are those who are really good at making problems. Unfortunately, we don't need more of them. And there's very few that are good at solving problems. So it sounds like from your young age, you were kind of looked at in the family, maybe in your area as someone who solved problems. How important do you think that was in learning young that if you can solve a problem, it's, it makes you much more valuable, you know, versus just making and finding. Absolutely everything. I mean, I think that, you know, being looked at at that person that not only could solve the problem, but could, you know, bring an energy to the situation that was positive and always energy. put that positive spin on it. You know, not only was I looked at as that leader, but also knew at a very young age that we always have a choice, right? When things come our mm. way, We have the choice to rise above and lead ourselves through it or be a victim to it. And that choice is always there. And I learned that at a very young age. Absolutely. Some people look at it as things happening to them. Other say things happening for them and learning from them and moving forward. So, okay. So you start in real estate, you start as an assistant. Now it seemed like you moved up that ladder pretty quickly. What was that story like as you moved up the ladder and what was, how did you progress so quickly? Yeah. So I, as I said, was an assistant and fell in love with real estate, fell in love with that. You know, it, it was my creation. I could be as big or small as I chose it to be. And I loved this idea of being able to impact people, you know, one by one through their experience. And so I was an assistant for a while and then got my real estate license at the age of 19 and started building my company. And, you know, really what I knew early on was that the mindset and way of being that I had as my default was not going to get me to where I wanted to go. And so the way that I, you know, sort of combated that or dealt with that rather was, you know, being willing to, you know, be a student at all times. And I started diving into every mindset book. I would watch The Secret back in 2005, 2006. That was popular. I remember that. I had it playing, you know, in loops. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. So I would watch that almost every day for a good six months to really reprogram my mindset, where I was coming from, and then was diligent with vision boards and what my outcomes were. And that truly was, you know, why I was able to go, you know, from really nothing, start that company to being one of the top teams in the state in just a few short years. Well done. Now, I think a lot of the time, some of us, we we get an insight, we, we have a clue, success leaves clues, as David Melter says. And but yet, if we don't properly notice it and turn it into an actual breakthrough, then it doesn't have long lasting, you know, positive consequences. So I know that's something that you're really good at in, in teaching entrepreneurs and especially female entrepreneurs on how to do that. What are some of the keys to processing and insight and actually turning that into a real breakthrough, something tangible? Yes, this is one of my favorite topics to talk about because so often it happens for us where we get this insight and what is the first thing we want to do with it? We want to do something. We want to take action on it and really to allow an insight to turn into a breakthrough. We have to be willing to have the insight and do nothing about it for a period of time. For you, it could be a couple of minutes. For me, it could be a couple of days. Of course, it depends on the insight. But to really take an insight to a breakthrough, we have to be willing to see it and have the awareness of what's going on, insight, and be willing to be in action, right? To to be in a state of inaction so that you can see really the, the grandiose, the size, whatever it is in the insight, to transfer into a breakthrough. If we move too quickly into doing something about it, we're only dealing with the symptom. And so the insight doesn't fully have the opportunity to permeate into our being, into our consciousness and actually turn into a breakthrough. Once you do have the insight and you have that awareness of, okay, I have seen this for what it is, then it would be appropriate to take action as it's, as it's appropriate, but it's so important to see the truth and not do anything about it so that you can see the vastness of the insight. 
Mm, well said. What, what a great lesson for us all to learn. I think for a lot of us, it comes back to kind of different values and principles. And I think back to a previous company that I started, we had a lot of success, we grew fast, but I don't think we had a foundation of the right values and principles. And because of that, you know, ended up having to start over and, and start a, a new business. And this time we've got those values and principles on our wall that we live by doing what we say we're going to do and, and uh, focusing on solutions and those types of things. What are some of the values and principles that you feel, and of course, everybody's different and every business is different, but what are some of the maybe common principles of success that people who are really successful follow that you've implemented and now teach entrepreneurs that we need to be thinking about? Yeah. I mean, I think that, like you said, there's so many ways to skin the cat, right? It's like for each of us in our business, there are different core values, but I think that there are a couple of values or, you know, principles, as you said, that really define the successful to, you know, those that are just striving, really the people that claim it. And the two that come to mind that are, you know, predominant are a level of self-awareness, number one, you know, to be able to get curious about challenges, what are challenges, you know, showing me about myself versus going into blame, I said this earlier today in a meeting, it's like, if you're in blame, you're playing someone else's game. And that's just, it's so powerful, you know, to think of it that way, because when you're in self-awareness, you're able to, again, see it for what it is and not create a story about it that might keep you stuck in a reality that you're trying to change. And the second one that comes to mind is resourcefulness. You know, that's something that is so ingrained in me and something that, you know, through and through, I see the entrepreneurs that are at that next level of success, you know, they're resourceful. They're looking at, again, like you said earlier, how is this happening for me? What resources do I need to bring my vision together to fulfill my vision? And it starts and ends, I think, with the self-awareness and resourcefulness. No question. Self-awareness, resourcefulness, Certainly very important. It's crazy how many people are not self-aware of, of whether they're actually, you know, leading their team, uh, you know, helping them become better people, helping them build a career, showing them they actually care about them and, and, and that type of thing. So self-awareness is certainly a very valuable thing. Now, you talk a lot about the importance of self-trust. So why do you say that self-trust is kind of the one thing missing from even the most successful businesses out there? And, and yeah. what does that mean? Yeah. So in our society, we have been conditioned to validate or check and balance ourselves by judging external validations. What I mean by that is if this person approves of me, I'm on the right track, right? That comes from how we're raised, going back to how we started this conversation. Uh And so if you look at, you know, the things in your business that might not be the way that you want them to be, Ask yourself, is this an area where I'm fully trusting myself or is this an area where I am still making decisions conditioned upon what my employees might think, what my team might think, or even what my clients might think? Sometimes we can, you know, inappropriately transfer self-trust out into our clients. Of course, this is all subconscious where we aren't trusting ourselves and our judgment call. We're almost making decisions based on if our clients are happy or not. And our clients are going to be the happiest if we're in our truth delivering at the highest value or highest level, excuse me, you know, and the highest level of impact to help them reach their goals versus trying to be liked or, or pleasing others. And so when I look at the most successful companies, eat a lot of times those companies those leaders rather in those companies aren't fully trusting themselves. They're still basing decisions on conditions in the external world. Exactly. And the people who you see that are iconic, that are changing people's lives, they, they are really just, they, they see it themselves. They have their own vision and they're not necessarily, I'm sure they, they ask for feedback 
but they're not making decisions based on what somebody might think, what their client might think. And a lot of that you said, uh, and we talked a little bit about this before we started, comes from our upbringing, comes from, you know, maybe some mommy issues, things that we might have. How does that uh, impact us as entrepreneurs? And, and how can we, you know, be aware of that and then, you know, move forward the right direction? Yes. It's so interesting as I dig into, you know, things with my clients at the highest level. One thing that's really fascinating to me is that areas of the business that are not working or where they're using the word frustration, that always shows me that there's some level of victim consciousness present. And so one thing that I do with with my clients that really everyone can do today is if there's a level of, is if there's an area of your business that is not working the way that you know it could, the way that you envision that it can work, it may be related to some inner child work that you might be able to do. And so something that I find really helpful to sort of bridge this, this gap is to really invite that small part of you, that inner child into decisions that you might be making in the business. And so to talk a little bit about how this might be showing up first before going into that tip. A lot of times when there is, you know, mommy issues or daddy issues that can show up in us being super high achieving people. A lot of times when we're achieving, it can come from not enough tendencies. Again, this is all subconscious. And so being aware of what is driving your results, what is driving you? Are you achieving because you're running away from some pain that you don't want to face? Or are you achieving because you truly want to make that impact and it's on your heart to serve and influence in that way? If your answer is more in alignment with the first question or first answer where it's like, you know, I'm creating because I think that if I achieve or if I build this seven or eight figure company, that then I'm going to be enough, then I'll be loved, then I'll belong. It might do you service to start a journey with your inner child and ask questions like, simply put, if I were talking to my inner child, I would say, Stacey, how are you doing today? And it seems a little out there. I want to be the first to say that. But the more that you almost look at this, like I'm including myself all of the pieces and parts of myself in the subconscious, in the conscious, and even in the unconscious, because those three dynamics are at play in the brain and subconsciously, then you're able to bring those parts of yourself to the table to make more intentional decisions versus reactionary decisions that might be coming from the subconscious. Oh, that's that's well said. As, As you're sitting there talking, I'm thinking about, you know, myself when I was a younger entrepreneur and, you know, the oldest of nine kids. And it seemed like I was always trying to please my parents and especially my dad, right? I was always trying to prove my dad that, that hey, I, I was doing. And so, and now I think about it when I was younger, I always had to like almost, almost brag, oh, I'm doing this project. Oh, I'm doing this business. Oh, I've got this investment. Oh, I've got this many employees. And as I've gotten older, I realized just how immature that is. People who are leaders and who are making an impact don't have to sit and, you know, tell everybody everything they're doing. In fact, the people who are the most quietest who are asking the questions and leading, they don't have to go into those types of details. And I think that's a great example. That's what you're making me think of. And so everyone out there, if you're working out, if you're driving, as you're listening to the podcast, if you're at home, you know, think about the things that you do that are actually holding you back, maybe some limiting beliefs connected up to your childhood, to your upbringing, and how you can take those, you know, next steps forward and, and get to success. So now there's a lot of talk these days, Stacy, about uh, kind of mindset and trying to coach up your mindset. Why is it, in your opinion, that mindset coaching really is not effective? Yes, it's, it's so ineffective if we don't first deal with the root. And so that's part of my journey. Just a little backstory is that I was working with all the mindset coaches. I, at one point I had a coach in my real estate career a business coach. I had a personal coach, you know, just trying to be all hands on deck in my development so that I could be at my 
you know, highest level of performance for my team and clients. And after it was significant, it was after that time when there were multiple coaches and I finished with those coaches that I internally felt the same. I had learned some great techniques, but I wasn't transformed just from the inside out. And it got me thinking really what is missing in this process? Because if I don't figure it out, I'm just going to spend a lot more money hiring all these different coaches. And so what it, what dawned on me was that we weren't dealing with the emotions. And so that, what I mean by that is when we're able to excavate the emotions that are at the core of the patterns and programs that run our lives, we can start to get in the driver's seat of choosing emotions versus the emotions running us. So often we make decisions based in emotion And we're actually then a victim to whatever heightened emotion, positive or negative might be running instead of being able to see the facts of the situation without commentary, without a story and make empowered decisions that are on purpose to fulfill our intentions. And so that's really what I see missing in the mindset coaching industry is that mindset alone is just dealing with the symptoms. It's just dealing with the surface where we need to go deeper and be empowered alongside our emotions and then add on the mindset work. So I often, I compare it to, you know, like grass. If you look at emotions at work, I call it emotions at work, digging at the root of like the grass, you're able to identify the emotions. And then fertilizer is the mindset work where it actually helps the grass grow at that point where mindset alone, that work only goes so deep. And so a lot of times you'll see people in the same habitual pattern because they're not actually seeing the the program that's running in the subconscious. So let's say I I wake up, you know, and for whatever reason, I didn't sleep well, my five-year-old somehow ended up in my bed and he's kicking me in the face all night and I'm tired and I get to work and I've got the wrong emotional state what are some of the tools that I need to use to change my emotional state and get the right state so that I can lead my team so I, I can speak with my clients and, and connect with uh, other partners? Like what, what are some of the tools you use as a professional to get the right frame of mind so that you can lead and not let your emotional baggage kind of weigh you down? Yes. So what I recommend is if you, you're in that state is first bring attention to your internal state. And so what that looks like is simply saying, what is the emotional state I'm currently in? Because what a lot of times what we try to do is we try to change it before seeing what's actually happening, which then just suppresses what's happening even more. And so first ask yourself, what internal state am I in? And so that might be like in the case with the five, your five-year-old, you know, being in bed with you and not sleeping well, you know, it might be first exhaustion try to go deeper. It's like, what's below that exhaustion? Is there something that comes up when I ask that? Yeah, no, absolutely. I I can think about, you know, I've got this new program that I launched within one of uh, my programs for my clients and communities, and I'm having some issues with it and it's not working out the way it's supposed to. And so maybe at the end of the day, that's actually that I like what you're saying. You ask the question why and dig deeper. There's actually something deeper that's really the cause of why you're feeling that way. And when you can identify it, well, now we can solve that problem by identifying it. But if we don't know the real problem, we never get to the root cause of it. Yeah, exactly. Because as you just experienced, we're talking about your five-year-old getting in bed with you, but what you answered was completely different. It was about the program that you're concerned about or thinking about making sure that it's, you know, exactly what you want for your clients. So that's, it's, I thank you for sharing that because it's such a beautiful example of what this work does when you dig deeper then you actually can get to the core of it. Mm, Absolutely. Now, language is a big part of how we lead, how we we communicate with people. And I had a a neuro linguistics uh, coach on a a week ago, and he, it was interesting. He talked about in sales calls, when you use the right language, it changes the entire framework of the way a client or partner might look at things. And yet there are words that we use ourselves as high performers they put us into trouble and, and even change the way we think in a negative aspect. What's, what's a word or two that you think that we really need to focus and be aware of 
as, uh, as high performers. Yes, this is one of my favorite topics to talk about because it's so powerful. The couple of phrases, number one is, I don't know. The moment you say, I don't know, and it could be something like, you know, you're trying to, to launch a program and there's some aspect of it that you don't know. Be willing to remove that from your vocabulary because you do know your higher self, your innate wisdom has access to information that you can tap into. And so if you commit to not saying that, and do things like show me the solution that commands the mind to focus on the solution versus, Oh, I don't know how to do this part. And so that shuts down your creativity. The other word that I ask clients to remove from their vocabulary is the word need. I need to do this. I need to do that. Need is based in lack. And so from the mind's perspective, you know, shifting to desire or even the word choose, I choose to do this. The mind then is activated and agrees with the fact that you're empowered in choice. And so when you use words purposefully, like I choose to do this and I give the example very simply as like, I need to go take a shower real quick while I have a few minutes, you know, before my day starts, even something as simple as that start practicing saying, I choose to go and shower right now before my day starts. It feels a little awkward, but it's going to set the mind up so that when you really need to use language intentionally, you go more in the direction of I choose versus I need. Even me saying that there is an energetic like constriction that happens when I say I need versus I choose, right? There's even, there's a different resonance with that. And that's more of what we're talking about from a vibrational standpoint. No question, guys. So as, as you're taking notes there, eliminate, I don't know, and I need out of your vocabulary and good things are going to happen. As you were just saying that, I could just feel, you could just feel a little bit of anxiety. Oh, I need to do this. Oh, I need to do that by changing. Hey, I'm going to do this. I, I get to do this. I choose to do this. I desire. I'm excited. It's just a completely different mindset of how you're saying that. And the energy is different. And I feel like there's anxiety that we all have when we say, oh, I need to do this. It's like a worry. It's like a, a scarcity type thing. And that is a huge way to empower you, yourself, your team, your employees, your clients. Like, I think it, there's no end to how that can work. Um, you know, I, I think we all have, it, it, there's a lot of self-awareness that I think you're really painting a clear picture for us. So in light of being self-aware and understanding that we do have all of us shortcomings and maybe some toxic traits that are holding us back, um, how are these holding us back? And more importantly, how do we, you know, eliminate them or get to the next level where we transcend them? I mean, what, what does that process look like? Because high performers, like there are little toxic things that we have. Yes, absolutely. Um, I mean, I think on one hand, it's what got us here, right? But there's a level where you have to start having a new level of self-awareness to see what your shortcomings are and eradicate them for good. You know, I think of what is the couple most common toxic traits that, that I see and even have, you know, had challenges with, with myself. And I think that the number one is looking at blame, you know, and, and I talked about this a little bit ago, but the ways high performers blame others is a little different than people that aren't high performers. The way that high performers blame is saying things like I'm frustrated this person isn't doing X, Y, Z in some way we give our power away to a situation. And so really looking at blame and really looking at, you know, okay, am I giving my power away because I'm not intentionally creating how I want someone to show up in my organization? I'm allowing them to run amok. Therefore then I'm blaming that can be a toxic trait that left unattended to can result in really disempowerment over time, right? If there's an employee or team member that's, um, you know, behaving in such a way and you just choose frustration, then resentment builds and then whatever comes after that. So I think it can be a slippery slope if not attended to. 
No question. I mean, I, th- I can think of a toxic trait I had where I, I would just let someone who's not doing something the right way and, and causing problems in the office, instead of confronting, I, I just wanted to avoid the confrontation. And that just m- made the problem get worse and worse. And so now being aware of that toxic trait, I mean, you know, okay, that's one of my issues. I need to hit it. All right, we're going to fix this problem. And we're going to you know be candid about it in a respectful manner and try and find that solution together. And, and that's huge. And the another toxic trait I used to have was just the just kind of really second guessing decisions. And, oh, you know, I don't know if this is the right decision. And, and at some point when I started the next business after the previous one, there was confidence and just trusting, like you said, the self-trust, I think is, is absolutely huge. Well, Stacy, you have dropped a number of value bombs. I know everybody listening our, our one thing here is we've got to take action, right? You've, you've dropped an amazing array of solutions and tools to help us as high performers, achievers, entrepreneurs, and small business owners to succeed, but we must take further action. We can't just listen passively and not take the next step. So how can we implement this? Where can we go online and connect with you and your programs and your truth teachers to kind of take this next step? Yeah, the best way is to go to our website. There's several options there, such as book a call. We love scheduling calls with people because we're committed to just leaving you with some value add. Even, you know, if you decide that it's not a fit, we want that opportunity to impact, you know, in some way. And so that's the truthteachers.com. The best way to reach us is the website. Okay, guys, that's the truthteachers.com dot com, a lot of tools and amazing things. The fact that you can actually schedule with Stacy and her team and really connect and figure out what you need to do to get uh, to get the right tools to succeed, the right, uh, you know, understand more about mindset and emotion. And, and really, uh, there's just limiting beliefs that we don't even realize we have in a lack of uh, just missing a few toxic issues there. And when you fix those, you can fix the culture in your business. You can fix relationships in your home, in your family. So guys, please go to the truthteachers.com. Take action. Implement what you're learning. Take the next step. Stacy. the final word is yours. What should someone do as they go down this path? towards a better life and a better business? I think, you know, the number one thing is to know that you are resourceful. You have the ability to create and the power to choose. You know, a lot of times in the busyness of life, we can fall under that false assumption that we don't have a choice, you know, that stuff is happening to us and you always have a choice. You always have a choice to make today great, to make tomorrow great. I love the idea that we get an opportunity to step up and take another swing, right? We get to hit that home run tomorrow. We get an opportunity to try again. And so take that and partner that with the power of choice and create the destiny that you desire. It's yours for the taking. Mm. Destiny is yours, guys. Take the choice, make great decisions. And the first decision that you should make today is to go to the truthteachers.com. Stacy, thank you so much for being a guest. Really enjoyed it. And guys, take action. Go to that website. Are you looking for more seven figure secrets, content, or even how you can launch your own recession proof business? Then check out sevenfigures.com. That's the digit seven, F I G U R E S.com, where we share more videos, stories, strategies, funding solutions, entrepreneurial education, and even the secret business type that's recession proof. Thank you for listening. And if you're finding value in our podcast, please give us a five star and invite others to join the club. When you're launching a new business, there are so many things you don't know about incorporating taxes, online presence, business and social media, key performance indicators, even how to build corporate credit scores. That's why we took some of our most successful strategies and poured them into the Seven Figures Accelerator. It's an entrepreneurial education platform that's helped empower hundreds of new entrepreneurs with the tools they need to succeed and grow to seven figures. So check out sevenfiguresaccelerator.com to watch the free workshop. Again, that's sevenfiguresaccelerator.com.